Bonjour à tous et à toutes. Hello, everyone. My name is Nathan Jugilomé, and I'm the CEO of Dialogue New Brunswick. I would like to welcome you to our public dialogue on cultural diversity, aptly titled The Dialogue That Changed My Life, uh, which is being held to mark the first anniversary of the launch of the City of Dieppe's immigration strategy and World Day for Cultural Diversity for Dialogue and Development. These dialogues are posted on the Dialogue New Brunswick Facebook page in French and English, and also on the City of Dieppe's YouTube channel. This dialogue will be hosted in French, but uh, interpretation services uh, are offered and panelists can respond to the language of their choice. I'm pleased to host this dialogue today with Dylan Razafin Janibé, a grade 12 student at Mathieu Martin School. Hello, Dylan. Hi, Nadine. Um, I want to begin by acknowledging that we are meeting on the ancestral territory of the Mick Fast people. This territory is covered by the Peace and Friendship Treaties originally signed in 1725 by the Wulistaque, Mi'kmaq and Passamaquoddy peoples and the British Crown. The treaties were not intended to deal with the cession of lands and resources, but rather to recognize Wulistaque, Mi'kmaq and Passamaquoddy title and also to establish the rules of the relationship that would continue in the long term between the nations. We invite people who are listening to us via Facebook to indicate in the comment section which non-ceded territory they are joining us from today. I would now like to invite Yvon Lapierre, Mayor of Dieppe, to say a few words. Thank you, Dylan. Hello, everybody. I am very happy to welcome you here in Dieppe as part of this public dialogue on diversity. Your 2020-2024 strategy for the city, uh, the dialogue strategy, is based on the priorities of city council and uh, exp expansion Dieppe. And also the partner, I was, I almost forgot this, but our local partnership in terms of uh, uh, in immigration. Our role as a municipality is to tailor our services to allow for diversity and to promote multicultural dialogue in the community. And that's why a public dialogue such as this today is very important. You will also have an opportunity in the next few days to share your vision and your proposals on the Dialogue Dieppe or Dieppe Dialogue platform. you will be asked to tell us how we can show that um, Dieppe is a city where you that, that that promotes diversity i hope that you will be you will participate in that dialogue and that you will be uh, on, on media social social media is on our web platform Dieppe dialogue on how best to welcome immigrants. In closing, I would like to thank Dialogue NB for hosting and facilitating this important discussion. Thank you to all the participants and have a great discussion. Thank you, Mayor Lapierre. We will now, would now like to invite Benedict Ndiri Immigration Strategy Officer to make a, a, a few small announcements. Benedict. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Benedict. Thank you, Nadine. I'm very happy to be here this morning. I began in this position, uh, or uh, day, almost day for day, we were launching the new strategy for, uh, for immigration. And that strategy was based on a lot of work that was done at the regional and the municipal levels. It was very important to take position uh, because Dieppe is a francophone city that offers cities in both official languages. But Dieppe wants to value 
uh, cultural diversity. So, I mean, you could be saying, oh, are we having yet another discussion on, uh, on diversity? We are in a, in a time, even though we're talking about this issue a lot, there's still a lot of discrimination. There's a lot of uh, misinformation about cultural diversity and, and how to deal with it. We all have uh, prejudices, uh, whether they're conscious or unconscious. So this is a, a, it's a, it's a work that we have to pursue on a daily basis. I'm very proud uh, to work with the city and expansion yet to value uh, cultural diversity in our great community. And when we talk about cultural diversity, uh, we're talking about culture. The city of Dieppe is the largest French speaking community outside of Quebec. So that's a, that's an, a point of attraction or an, a feature that might, that can attract francophones in New Brunswick, in Canada and at the international level. Two days ago, we inaugurated our, our new headquarters, the CAFE headquarters here in Dieppe. So we're very proud of that new center. It's part of our strategic vision for immigration, uh, international students and French language immigrants are groups that have very specific needs. We're in a minority language setting and that is why we continue to focus on those priority groups. Last year, uh, starting with our strategy and, and even before that, uh, there, there are a number of projects that are underway. We've been working to have a better representation of visible minorities, uh, Indigenous peoples, uh, persons with disabilities, women. So we continue our efforts uh, to, to highlight those groups. And when we launched the strategy on immigration, we were in, uh, we were just getting into the pandemic. Now we're starting to see the end, the, the, the light at the end of the tunnel, which is an excellent news because we are going to be able to deploy things more and more. Uh, there are, and we'll be able to use uh, important dates, the International Day of the Francophony, the International Day of, uh, that, that we mentioned earlier on dialogue the World Day for Cultural Diversity for Dialogue and Development. So we, there are a lot of activities and projects to come. Uh, Mayor Lapierre was talking about this earlier. So we are going to be launching a survey where you can express your views on, on how we promote uh, diversity, whether at the library, city hall and other so how can our facilities essentially promote, uh, better promote cultural diversity? So that, that survey will be available for a two week period and you'll be, you're, you're all invited to, uh, to share your views. I'm not going to take any more time. I would like to uh, uh, give the mic back to Nadine. Thank you once again uh, to the city of Dieppe. Thank you, Benedict. I, it is my great pleasure to introduce the panelists who are joining us this morning. Muriel Berda, uh, Recruitment Coordinator. Murad Badiro, a Master's Student in Public Health at the University of Montreal. Lou Lavanchy, student uh, 11, uh, grade 11, Mathieu Martin. The unfortunate Jean-Yannick Ignat, who was supposed to be with his, here this morning, sent us his regrets after having health problems earlier this week. Uh, he is currently recovering and we want to thank him for his participation in the video shot for this event and uh, tell him that our hearts go out to him at this difficult time. Thank you, Dylan. And before going to the instructions, I just want to say how proud we are uh, of the name of your platform, Dialogue Dieppe. So I share with you a quote from Arthur Chan that guides us at uh, Dialogue and it's very appropriate for today's theme. Diversity 
is a fact. Equity is a choice. Inclusion is an action and belonging is an outcome. This is the first time you join one of our dialogues. Donc, le but de nos dialogues, c'est vraiment d'obtenir une meilleure compréhension sur un sujet. The purpose of our dialogues is to gain a better understanding of it, not to achieve resolution. If at the end of the dialogue, you learn something, then our mission is accomplished. Uh, you should also know that we publish reports on each of our dialogues and that these are shared with stakeholders and available to the public via our website. Now, as for today's proceedings, we will be asking questions to the panelists. Afterwards, we'll have time to answer a few questions and talk to the participants who are listening online. So you'll be able to write your uh, questions in the chat. We ask that you adhere to the following principles, which apply here in the same way as they do on our social media platforms. So we invite everyone to be respectful and courteous when posting their comments. Uh, the following will not be tolerated and will be systematically deleted. Uh, defamatory, abusive and obscene comments, uh, discriminatory statements based on gender, religion, uh, nationality or sexual orientation, uh, as well as state uh, state inciting hatred or violence. Over to you, Dylan. Thank you. All right, as uh, Artha Chan's quote says, diversity is a fact. The city of Dieppe understands this reality and has adopted an immigration strategy that, among other things, aims to value this cultural diversity and to promote and support intercultural community dialogue. Today's theme, the dialogue that changed my life, is inspired by the importance of dialogue. Sometimes it only takes a moment, uh, a connection with another person to cultivate a sense of belonging. We learned this by interviewing our four panelists over the past few days and hearing their stories. Each of them focused on an encounter with a person or persons that created that click uh, that allowed for that sense of integration. Opening up to each other encourages understanding and respect and that opens our hearts. Bar barriers come down and it is easier to see what we have in common rather than our differences. So now we'll be listening to a short video and the interpretation will continue after the video. Je m'appelle Brenda, j'étais un marché de la maison au service de logement et j'étais à l'université de Montpellier et je vivais un stress énorme dû au fait que j'ai plus proche j'en isolation par l'isolement de, de, de mon pays natal et elle elle m'a elle m'a Elle a pris le temps de discuter avec moi, de me faire vraiment découvrir euh, la culture acadienne, c'est-à-dire euh, tout ce qui est la poutine rapide, l'Allemagne. Ça s'est passé en peut-être une conversation de peut-être cinq minutes et ça m'a poussé à, à vraiment explorer le nouveau territoire dans, dans lequel je suis. Et ça, ça a été un élément déclencheur qui, comme effet papillon, m'a permis vraiment de bien m'enraciner ici. C'était très difficile au début, jusqu'à ce que j'ai commencé une amitié avec une fille euh, qui était métisse et qui avait vu que je ne me sentais pas plus acceptée de ça. Sa mère est académie et son père est jamais On n'a pas vraiment parlé plus que ça de sa culture, mais elle me parlait des expériences qu'elle a eues là-bas et des expériences positives comme négatives. Elle m'a vraiment changé ma perspective sur les choses et je me suis dit, bon, c'est pas parce que je suis une grande que j'ai pas besoin de d'être comme les autres, même si je suis européenne. Je me suis sentie, j'ai quand même créé un, un sentiment d'appartenance ici grâce à elle. En 2019, j'ai participé à la mobilisation de jeunesse organisée par le Centre de la francophonie des Amériques. C'était une, une activité qui réunissait les jeunes venus du Canada, les États-Unis aussi, et même l'Amérique du Sud, et aussi on avait des gens de, de l'Argentine. C'est une amitié. Et puis on apprend beaucoup plus des autres. Et parfois même, euh, on a l'impression que euh, euh, l'autre est différent de nous. C'est vrai qu'il y a une différence, mais le fait d'échanger, parfois nous fait comprendre que nous partageons quelque chose de commun. Et l'autre, ce n'était pas vraiment un bus à égal 2, mais un bus à égal 3 ou encore plus que ça. En fait, 
pour être très honnête, moi j'ai fait toute ma vie, parce que moi je suis une franco-italienne qui grandit en France, dans une famille euh, italienne, mais qui va à l'école chez les petits français, donc euh, tout est différent. Euh, donc ces dialogues-là, je les ai eus euh, depuis toute petite, sauf que l'enfant, bah, je ne savais pas que les autres, ils n'étaient pas comme moi. Quoi. Donc voilà, et encore aujourd'hui, euh, alors que je suis là depuis presque 4 ans maintenant, bien installée, euh, je continue dans ma lancée puisque tous les jours j'ai à faire des cultures différentes, des gens qui viennent d'Afrique, des gens qui viennent de France, de Belgique, euh, d'Amérique du Sud, je vais rencontrer des, des autochtones ici, je vais rencontrer des gens du monde entier. Et, euh, et, et tu dialogues et t'apprends. T'apprends pourquoi les gens font quelque chose, t'apprends d'où viennent les cultures, mais t'apprends aussi qu'il y a un million de similitudes. Euh, donc cette ouverture d'esprit que j'avais quand j'étais petite, euh, en fait elle m'a jamais. Euh, jamais quitté, mais en plus elle n'a jamais quitté mes enfants. Donc euh, tu t'aperçois que tu, tu transmets des valeurs. Je pense que c'est par un manque de connaissances sur d'autres cultures et sur, sur d'autres différences où les gens ils ont plus de préjugés qui ne sont pas forcément volontaires plus que ça, mais ils vont toujours être là. Et le, le meilleur moyen pour qu'on éradiquer un petit peu ce, ce préjugé comme ça, c'est en parler, de parler de plusieurs cultures, de parler de plusieurs euh, différentes personnes qui vivent ici. Les gens qui habitent ici, ils ont une histoire et euh, ils ont quelque chose à donner. Et les gens qui arrivent ici, ils ont aussi une histoire et quelque chose à, à, à donner en échange. Et il y a énormément de similitudes. Il y a tellement, et il y a tellement de similitudes que si les gens commencent à se mettre à, à, à se parler, euh, ben finalement, ils vont se trouver tellement de points de commun que prendre la même route au même moment avec les mêmes personnes, ça va devenir beaucoup plus, euh, beaucoup, beaucoup plus facile. Quoi. La diversité euh, de nos différentes communautés ici à Dieu peut permettre un, un essor euh, social, euh, économique euh, de la région et puis euh, le bien-être de tout le monde. Je pense que le futur, c'est le mixage, le multiculturel, c'est les gens de différents horizons qui vont vraiment former le, le, le diable de demain. Et il faut qu'on commence la conversation dès maintenant. Quelle belle vidéo. Merci What a beaucoup. beautiful video. Thank you to, very much to our panelists who are here with us today. And Jean, Annick, Igna, it really sets the tone. And that's what's going to help us uh, start the discussion with you today. I love that Jean Yannick had said one plus one equals three. And it's true that there's a multiplying effect. And Murad, uh, you were talking about the, the Diep of tomorrow. I would say that when when we look at the room around us today, it's the, it's already we're already there. It's the Diep of today. So thank you very much. The first question that we have for you is very simple. We want to learn more about you. So can you summarize in a few minutes who you are and what brought you to Diep? Muriel, let's start with you. Oh, your microphone, please. Oh, sorry about that. Hello, everybody. Hi, Nadine. Thank you to Nadine and, and everyone for giving me this opportunity to be here today. So who am I? Good question. It's never easy for Europeans to talk about themselves, but uh, I'll try it. I'm from France. I'm a Franco-Italian. I came here about four years ago. Uh, I was uh, a manager, I was a, a municipal councillor for about 12 years in France, and I worked on facilitating uh, and helping people settle in France. Multiculturalism has always been a present feature in my work and in my life. In France, I had a business that was to get people to come and invest on the Côte d'Azur. And uh, most, most clients were not French. And they were from all around the world, Dubai, United States, uh, other countries in Europe. And I always found that very enriching. Uh, 
there were exchanges with uh, other European high schools. At one point, diversity becomes part of your everyday life. So now I work as the uh, a, a recruitment coordinator for uh, care centers, and I work from with people that come from around the world on a daily basis. So what brought me to Dieppe and, and to New Brunswick? Well, the first thing is, is the people here. Really, it is the people. There's a community spirit, there's an openness, and there's a happiness. Uh, there's a lot of laughing uh, in my job. Uh, so that's what brought me here. And cultural diversity as well, to be able to, being able to be who I am, some, someone with a background in, in, in various countries. And there are a lot of people like me, so I feel good here. There's openness, and, and that's why I left France uh, four years ago. And I also wanted my children to experience other things. Now, in terms of the, La Francophonie, Dieppe is, is a very representative community. Uh, Mayor Lapierre. It's, you know, to see that he's working on a, an immigration strategy geared to dealing with the difficulties that immigrants encounter. It's important. And, and I feel at home here already. Thank you, Muriel. Murad, your turn. Tell us about yourself. I came to Canada on August 28th, 2013. And I came to support my sister. I was, I felt extraordinarily welcomed here in New Brunswick. And, and the point, my goal was just to come for my holidays and then to go back to France, but I ended up staying. I studied at the University of Moncton. I got a, a bachelor's degree in, in kinesiology. And now I work as a, a professional DJ. And that has allowed me to uh, to discover a lot of things in New Brunswick. I used I used to live on Gauvin Street, and when I moved to Montreal for my masters, I became a defender of New Brunswick, a promoter of New Brunswick. I. There was a big debate uh, among my fellow students. Uh, and then with last year with the coronavirus, I felt, uh, well, I have a family here. So what brought me back to settle here and try to develop myself is my family. So I'm, I'm working on finishing my master's in, in public health. And that's basically my story. Thank you, Murad. Lou. <clears throat> Tell us just your story. Who are you? Well, thank you for inviting me here today. My name is Lou Lavanchi. I'm 15 years old. I am from Switzerland. My parents decided to move here because it was a French-speaking area, first of all. Uh, they had already come in 2013 uh, on a trip. Uh, they'd liked, they had really liked the culture and people here. So we've been here for about six years. I'm, I live in Memram Cook. Now, unfortunately, I don't have as many things to say as Muriel and, and Murad because I don't have as, as, much, as much experience, but I, you know, I have, I've had a really good experience as an immigrant and I, I appreciate being here. Thank you to all three of you. All right, next question. In your lifetime, have you participated in a dialogue which strengthened your in, interest in cultural diversity can you tell us about this experience? Murad, can you start? Well, uh, I had my, my conversation was with Brenda. She was my supervisor at the housing department. And I say this to everybody. I think everybody has heard of my, sis, my story, but, but it, it really uh, impressed me. If I had not had the chance to discuss with her 
I may not have taken the route that led me here. She took the time to talk to me, to help me learn more about the local culture. And th so Brenda was really the, the trigger for me, who allowed me to open myself up to other people. Uh, Olivier Barreau, for example. And I'll just share a little anecdote here. We were in class. I think it was Mr. Roger Leblanc's course in, in uh, sociology. And we were supposed to wear pink that day. And I decided to wear pink. And Olivier did too. And so we finished the class and we left. And I, I asked him, I said, well, let's go take a bite. Let's go get a bite at, at a restaurant. And we went to the buffet and everybody was surprised to see a black and a white man together wearing pink, uh, eating together. So we were at our table and everybody would, it was coming up to us. And it was really funny. For me, it was a proof of the open-mindedness of the people of Dieppe. And it, it really kind of uh, helped me feel, develop a sense of belonging. So in closing, I will just to say, it was my discussion with uh, Brenda that really uh, set the tone for me and led me to where I am today. Thank you, Juan. Lou. Well, the discussion f for me was with a girl, as I also alluded to in the video. Uh, I, I used to be going to, a, I used to go to a school here in Memoramacook, and I was kind of integrating. Things weren't going very well, if I'm, if I'm going to be honest. I started talking to this girl uh, the last year, and, and we started kind of chatting more and more. She had had uh, negative experiences because she was of mixed uh, race as well. She had struggles. She... And so I talked to her about how I was feeling, the concerns I had, and she really opened my eyes and she proved to me that I could integrate into the community without other people's permission. She really helped me with that. And I will never forget that. It was a great experience. Thank you, Lulu. And let's end with um, uh, Muriel. It's going to be a little difficult for me to think of one particular moment. There, are, there, there have been many moments. Uh, and I have a lot of these experiences every day as well. If I think of what really changed my life, it was right at the very beginning when I arrived here. I was at, I I was at the Dieppe market as a client, as a customer. And I met Suzanne Lévy-Peters, who was there. So Suzanne is Micmac. She's from Elsie Buktuk. And we started talking. Now, as you, as you know, as you probably understood already, I'm a very curious person. So we started talking and she taught me two things that I knew, that I already kind of knew, but she confirmed. So she explained the encounter, the meeting between the Acadians and the Mi'kmaq. Uh, she would explain to me that the Mi'kmaq flag And, and it talks about connection. And then she talked to me as well about, we were talking about colors and artists and, and, and things like that. And she explained to me that regardless of our, the color of our skin, we all represent an element, water, fire, earth. And that if you don't have all of that together, you can't operate, you can't function. And did I know that before? Yes, I did, sort of. But the fact that she talked about it, and maybe, you know, that her, she showed me the visual, um, what she showed me 
confirmed and strengthened that understanding in me. So, and it went even a bit further. Um, we, we started that our discussion kind of her um, led to the organization of or to the opening of an office in Shidyak. So I've learned a lot of things, but I, you know, every, you know, a simple dialogue, the simple impulse to go and ask and learn more about some somebody, um, you know, this has kind of flowered into a great friendship that is very dear to me. Uh, I discovered a different culture, different way of doing things, and uh, and it adds to my body of knowledge, my knowledge of uh, l'Acadie and essentially the place where I live. Thank you, all three of you. We're going to go down a little deeper now. You've had these moments, this moment or several moments in your life. What, how has this moment or moments impacted your personal or your professional life? This, this uh, encounter with Brenda or your friend Lou or with Suzanne and other people, Muriel, how, how does this impact your personal and professional life? So we will start with Lou this time. As I mentioned, I had a lot of trouble integrating at the beginning. And this encounter really opened my eyes to the fact that I'm allowed to integrate, that I'm allowed to feel at home. And she really changed the way I looked at everything on the, on the, on my move here. At the beginning, I was really closed, uh, looking onto myself, but she op helped me open my eyes. She said, I, I was allowed, I had a right to integrate and that uh, she explained the problems she had had as well. And she really changed my whole perspective on integration into my new community. And I really made sure I, I uh, stood my position in my school in Memram Cook and in Dieppe. And it's thanks to her. Thank you. Lou, in what you're telling us, is it possible that I, I get this impression that you're talking about this feeling of a loneliness? Yes, exactly. It was early, it was difficult at the beginning because I started in a, a new school in grade five and then I had to change schools again. And of course I had just changed countries. So I felt very alone. I had no sense of belonging. And she helped to draw a roadmap for me to reach integration. Thank you. M Muriel, could you explain how this moment impacted your personal and professional life? Well, this is an impact. It wasn't a single moment. It's something that happens every day. But the fact that we have this openness, that we are able to know more cultures, it, it opens us to other people, to the whole community, and it gives us the key. Uh, the key to reducing the challenges when you know how people operate because they're from this culture or that one sometimes it doesn't take a lot to get two cultures to understand each other and quite often i realize that one person is saying something and the other is saying the same thing but they're not saying it in the same way so it's, it doesn't stem from the same experience so it's, it's interpreted differently so just the fact that we have uh, the possibility of having these keys or it, it allows us to open up to different cultures. When the Acadians explained to me what their childhood was like, when they explained their, their whole life experience and this, as Lou was saying, this makes me want to try and protect the children of newcomers who arrive here. And what she experienced is very frequent. So when when we explain some, when we realize that we're not alone, that's already makes a difference. So, oh, I'm not alone. It's already happened to somebody else. 
so I'm not alone. So yes, it opens up all sorts of doors, professionally and personally, because it allows me to ask questions, to learn new words, to learn a new language, different ways of saying things, and that, that's part of integration. So yes, so that's what it allows me to do on a daily basis. Thank you, Muriel. Murad. Yes, there's one thing I'd like to bring up. And uh, amongst the many discussions I had with her, because I was the, the manager at a residence, and each time I went downstairs, I'd go by her office. So we had numerous conversations. And each time when somebody asks me, how do you feel? I always answer, oh, I'm tired all the time. And she told me, you know what? Even if uh, the, the, you can't judge a book by its cover, people have do judge through your appearance. And sometimes the first appearances are the most important. And w if you don't have any further opportunities, for example, and she said, you know what, let's do, let's try something because, and I, I still do it sometimes, but quite often. I'm, I'm very relaxed and informal to go to my classes and, and perhaps uh, we talked about this on the Wednesday and on the Monday, I changed the way I dressed. I started wearing shirts and jeans and I wear them for one week. And I realized that, or I noticed that my, my teacher and even my friends, the way they addressed me, the way they approached me, it was completely different. And through that, I realized that people look at me differently. They consider me differently. And so to continue in that vein, it made me change my perspective because because of that, I had to, done a, a I participated in a funding campaign for the homeless in 2015, I believe. And, and I mean, one thing led to another, of course, because it really changed my perspective. I, did, I didn't even think I'd be continuing my education that I'd get my master's. I just wanted to finish my bachelor's and go into music, which I love. But it really changed me. It allowed me to have much more opportunity. I sit on different committees now. And there are a number of things that I do now that if I hadn't had that conversation with her, perhaps I wouldn't have done those. And the way I dress is one of the elements. So it's something that really uh, hit me. So it doesn't matter where I go, as long as it's a, an official appearance now. I always dress in a suit because when you meet somebody for the first time, you want to give a good impression. And so so that's what uh, helped me. So before we go to the next question, Dylan, I just want to add something. Murad, I get the impression that Brenda was like a mother to you, right? Oh, definitely. When when I, well, she she was very much she was very nice but she was like a mother yeah and i remember at where at the, the housing department and i had the keys for all of the rooms in case of emergency in case of accidents or if we had to open up the rooms so i lost my uh, master key and it's about 10 or 20 thousand dollars worth because if you lose your key you have to change the locks of all the doors because you don't want that person who finds the master key to have access to all of the doors. And she is the first person I went to see. And she came to look for the key with me after her shift. And that really hit me. She was really like a mother to me. Every time I have the opportunity now, I go to see her. She's my Acadian mother. 
like, great, thank you. And in your opinion, how can dialogue act as a key to cultural diversity in Dieppe? Should I continue? Sure, Muriel, if you would like to start. Oh, we could change the order here, I don't mind. How does uh, dialogue, how can it act as a key to cultural diversity? Dieppe is so dynamic, it's so vibrant, uh, it's growing so quickly that through cultural diversity, I think, uh, and I can see this prof uh, on a professional level, when you have a number of different cultures that have different needs to a certain extent, it, it gives you access to different uh, resources, human resources as well. When you integrate different people into your business, into your development, you win twice. It's a double victory because, of course, you have access to different ways of doing things. You have access to different things that will help you move forward. And leaving your comfort zone is never easy for anybody. But other than that, you also have access to inner knowledge. What, what is, is, how do I address new people? How do I do to meet the needs of that culture? Should I speak in a certain way or in another way? What can I exchange? And so we're creating wealth, personal wealth and population wealth, this wealth for the people who arrive as well as the people who are already here. But we're creating this incredible wealth on the economic level by hiring people from elsewhere, by proposing different things. And if we propose different products that are not necessarily Acadian products, well, automatically you're, you're letting the people from here uh, familiarize themselves with another culture. It, it's, 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 uh, and I think that I believe in uh, twinning. And I did a lot of that when I was a youth, you, we twin cities or countries, but I believe in it as a person, as a family, but I also believe in it uh, within businesses on, on a volunteer basis, because that's, that's how you get the information. That's how you discover, as Lou said, that's how you you learn how to integrate and it allows for exchanges. In my life, I've done it with with the, the state. I have an adopted mother and father, but I'm not going to tell you my age. But they've been with they've been my my parents for a long time because I had lost my uh, biological parents when I was very young. So these are my adopted parents. But it sets it creates links that like Mohad said, that can last for a whole lifetime and it can make things easier for a whole lifetime. Thank you, Muriel. I'm now going to ask Mohad to give us his thoughts. Well, I don't know if it's the same thing for Benedict in the Ivory Coast, but for us in Bina, when a person who's older than you speaks to you, you lower your eyes. You don't look at them directly. And I had asked for a meeting with my professor, and my professor was explaining the class to me, the requirements of the class, and I had my head lowered because I didn't want to look at him directly out of respect. And he told me, well, are you listening to me or not? Or, And by discussing it with him, I made him realize that it was through respect, out of respect, that I wasn't looking at him in the eyes it was out of respect. And he said, no, 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 here you can. It doesn't bother me. You can look at me, look at me in the eyes. I have to be able to see that you're following me, that you're understanding. And so it's by, you know, I, I want to see you look at me to help me understand if you're understanding me. And so that was important for me. So dialogue is important. We have to know what other people expect of you. We have to know what are the cultural expectations and what it, what is your culture as well. And my teacher, Mr. Roger Leblanc, and through one of his classes told us, we often hear that we have to treat 
others the way we would like to be treated. But that's not always true because the others sometimes would like to be treated in a way that is more culturally sensitive to them. For example, I, I, if, if my teacher hadn't brought anything else up, I wouldn't have ever looked him in the eyes. But I think that dialogue is the basis for everything else. It allows us to discover what the person you're talking to has to offer you and what you can offer. It's a, it's on the economic level, but on the human level mostly, because we can never put aside the human aspect. It's very, very important to, to move to, towards each other. Thank you. Thank you, Mohad. Very interesting. And Lou? Well, like Mohad said, dialogue is the basis of a good re relationship, but it's also the basis of all relationships. If you have no communication, there are misunderstandings, and that's that's in holds for interpersonal relationships as well as uh, relationships between countries, everything. And if there are no discussions between different people of different cultures, we'll always maintain these prejudices, conscious or not. And that can lead to cultural problems, problems. Oh, how should I say this? You have the, the wrong image of a person, the wrong impression of a person, and it leads to misunderstandings. And it's very important to speak about culture and to introduce yourself to and to uh, uh, appreciate other cultures, to respect them as well. But just to speak to each other, because that's at the basis of, of everything. And if we start presenting other cultures, especially here, there is going to be a, a spread of more understanding and uh, more things. People will understand each other better, and that's very important. And it will help people it, with their integration. The, these problems with integration uh, shouldn't uh, shouldn't exist as much. But if we could talk to each other better, we'll, that will allow for a better integration of newcomers. Thank you. Can we ask us to add something to that? Lou, we're, you were talking about uh, prejudices. We had a dialogue last year on unconscious prejudices and bias. And if you remember, we learned that it's it's a scientific. This, the brain can only hold, and I don't remember the exact figure, but as I don't know, maybe like 10,000 bits of information at a time, whereas we're exposed to millions of them. So it's like if you had a backpack and it's up to us to put new information into this backpack, new tools continually. So what Murad was explaining a little earlier, this this cultural nuance, this what the differences between the culture in your country and ours, that is so, so important. Because if Roger hadn't told you about that, you wouldn't have known. You wouldn't have known that here, yes, we do look at each other in the eyes. You wouldn't have had the chance to express why you weren't. So these cultural references are so important. And I'm just wondering, do you have any ideas on how we could uh, share these cultural differences more and better with the people here? Well, I think it's through activities, able to break the ice between us. Because 95% of it is breaking the ice. People have trouble going towards others. And if we have some sort of activity, and it's always easy to propose something, but I don't want to say it's easy, but I think 95% of it is the ice breaking part. Once you've broken the ice and you move on to the other side, you realize that the other person isn't necessarily very different from you. That person isn't a monster. It's not, it's, it's a person who is the same as you, but we have to break that ice. That's important for me. We have to find the means to do that in order to uh, 
approach each other, uh, immigrants or people from here, originally from here. I think that it's always it's also through education at school because the youth and, and prejudices start early in life. They, they, they start with our parents, but there are some at school as well. School plays an important role in the development of a child, a youth. So if we start uh, presenting different cultures uh, and different people and different customs right then, that will help break the ice and will allow people to integrate more easily. And we have to uh, pre present the uh, indigenous cultures and customs as well here, and that's important for them. And we have to present other cultures, uh, cultures from South America, from Africa, from everywhere. And that will help break down some prejudices as well and use the social networks because because of COVID, we were on the social networks a lot. We use our telephone a lot because we didn't have that many interactions with others. So our devices and social media are our first place of interaction. So I think it's important to raise these issues there and at school because that's really at the root of everything that we think of all our biases and prejudices. Muriel, I would like add you to add something. But first, I just want to add something myself and Dylan, I would also ask you to participate and to tell your story as well, or just to add to what you're hearing here, because I think Lou and yourself are about the same age, right? So, well, okay, let's do that. What do you think about what we've heard so far? Well, I think it's very interesting, especially when we talk about cultural diversity, and it, it's very present, of course. And as a matter of fact, in my experience, it was it was very difficult to integrate because it's not the same communication it, it's not the same language i mean we speak french yes but there are different expressions there are a lot of anglicisms in the french here so it communication was complicated right from the start but just through speaking with uh, people here, the Acadians, oh, different people. I think it was really interesting to, to learn more on their culture. I had a question for Murad, though. When you talked about lowering your eyes when you're talking to an older person, how do you feel today when you're talking to an older person? Are you comfortable? Now, uh, are you comfortable speaking to somebody? Do you look them in the eyes? Well, it depends on the context. One thing I did learn was that it's it, professionally, when I meet people, when I go to meetings, I uh, do uh, look people in the eyes. But of course, when I go back home to Benin in Africa, I have to apply the appropriate culture if I'm going to go visit my uncles or my grandparents, I have to do it in a, the culturally appropriate way. So it's one thing to be aware of different cultures, but you have to know when to apply what. So when I'm here, I'm, I'm not uncomfortable necessarily, but at some points I still have that automatic reflex, for example. When I was speaking to uh, his worship, the mayor, out of a reflex, I'd already lowered my eyes, my hands were behind my back just to give him space, just to, out of respect. So, but I'm working on it. Thank you. Well, I also wanted to add that I had heard that what's really great about knowing different cultures is you're going to be less inclined in thinking on a certain way, in a certain way. You can think in different ways on an issue. And I think that's that's great. Benedict, would you like to add anything? Thank you for giving me the floor. I, I would have a lot to say, actually, because my personal life, my own path in terms of cultural diversity and my personal history, 
those who know me know that my husband comes from another culture, and I was very surprised. Well, I've come from the Ivory Coast, and I spent a number of years in France and then in Canada. I've been here since 2005, and I had noticed that in the Canadian culture, at least where I lived at the time, men had a greater tendency to allow women to make advances. The approach was very different. So I was very surprised when the man who became my husband today to speak to me. And I was wondering what planet he was from, actually, because I found it very strange because that wasn't the way most people function. But then I, I realized that his approach was different because he'd lived in a multicultural uh, setting as well. And in here, we have to have dialogue in the education of our of children. We have a little boy, is actually, he's six. And already we realize that prejudices are already starting to take hold in the way he speaks. He, he doesn't say black and white yet, but he'll say, oh, he's he's light brown. Ma uh, is uh, light brown. Daddy is, is beige and mom is dark brown. But one day he came home from school with a story that just broke my heart. And I was really surprised that at that age, prejudices are already starting to show out. So he asked me in the car. I mean, this was a period in which we were, we heard a lot of talk about George Floyd and the States, all everything that had happened there. And he was asking, is it true that brown people like me, police officers, don't like us and poli the police is going to put us in jail? No, he didn't even say prison in French. He said in jail. So I, I knew it wasn't a story he had made up because he used the word jail in English. And uh, so I understood that this, this, is, this thought, this story came from, well, one of his friends in school. So this is a, a six-year-old. And a little earlier, we were talking about education. It's so important because it starts so early. If we don't if we don't have a certain, uh, if children don't hear hate speech, they won't invent it, they won't know about it. But they're like sponges, right, at a young age, and they absorb everything that they hear around them, whether it's right or wrong, whether it's good or bad. They they don't learn to filter at that age. But when something, they, they hear something in their family, or the, well, the it starts being integrated right away. So the dialogue is very important because right from a very young age, we have to start uh, being able to talk about it. We we can't just say that things will just develop naturally. No, they won't happen naturally, like Murad was saying. Naturally, he's, he's not going to look at somebody in the eyes. I mean, it's going to be an effort, a conscious effort each time. And that means we have to act proactively and have dialogue. It starts with dialogue but it includes all sorts of other things. We can implement other activities. That's the starting point. But we have to start from the principle that whatever your culture, nobody has any has bad intentions at the, at the start. So everything starts from curiosity and we have to learn about the others. And dialogue is important because even if you speak the language, like Dylan was saying, even if we speak French, the expressions are different. Uh, they're, they don't refer to the same thing. So dialogue is really at the basis. And so I really like the work being done by Dialogue NB, really. So I, I would have all sorts of stories to tell you, but but we, we don't have all day, perhaps uh, during another dialogue. Yeah, but this is the time where we're supposed to have these uh, discussions and exchanges. So once again, once again, Dylan, please speak out. Eh? I'd like to come back to the uh, schools and the school programs because people of my generation and others will remember this, that we didn't have the chance of having a 
cur curriculum. Uh, in our school program, we didn't learn the story of the indigenous peoples. We didn't learn about slavery here in New Brunswick. We tend to think that because we're Canadian, we're, we promote diversity and so on and so forth. And all of that is true, but we can't deny our history either. And people like ourselves who, when we grew up, we weren't exposed to all of these things. And like you were saying, and there, these prejudices, uh, we don't always know where they come from, but they are they're, They develop at a very young age. I uh, grew up in the, the Acadian Peninsula. Well, I mean, I, we didn't really have much interaction with uh, the uh, indigenous in our region, but when we'd go south, when we drove drive through Tricadi and Neguac and so on, well, we would see them. And I would ask my parents, well, what, who are, you know, where, why are they, who are they? And my parents would say, well, no, we don't go there. We're not going there. And, and I, I, why, why aren't we going there? So already at a young age, I, I learned that we had to, there was this distrust and I didn't know why. So, so yes, at least now you will have this opportunity. I hope already you're being learned you're learning about the uh, contribution of the indigenous in your school program, I think. And I heard the minister Cardi this summer said that it'll be the same thing for the history of the blacks. That'll be part of the uh, school program in the future. So it's important. So what can we do for, for our youth? I mean, there are already steps being taken, but what we can do for adults and to, for my, for my mother, my father, what, what can we do? I think that we have to try to to reach out to these older people, like my parents, and and that we could talk a little bit about history, the history in Canada, New Brunswick, uh, the history of the Indigenous peoples, uh, Black history as well. There 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 was slave uh, slavery that occurred in Canada. So I, I think that's very important. You know, I think we tend to, you know, to say, oh, these these older people didn't have education, but I mean, they have to. We have to make that education or give that make that education available, and that that will have a snowball uh, because it has a, a snowball effect. When you when you have prejudices, they tend to grow from generation to generation. So I think that there has to be education in in recreational activities, for example, that uh, older people participate in. I, no, I don't really know what the older people do, but but I'm sure that they could tell us. And so there could be some uh, ac some actions in in that side. Muriel, go ahead. Yes. Well, listen, I I work in a nursing home with older people, with seniors, and what you said made me think of something. You know, in these centers, in these nursing homes, when people of color arrive, so we need a dialogue and, and uh, with time and patience, we can eliminate those barriers. Uh, what I like is, is where I, I where I work, we have a multicultural week. Now I know it sounds, uh, you know, pretty plain, uh, but you know, we have people from Benin, from Ivory Coast, from South South America, from Europe, during that week, and, and this is all run by volunteers. And we also involve local residents, people who can who might be Anglophone or Acadians. We we all have something to contribute. So people prepare different meals and they explain, you know, why such and such a meal is traditional, how it's traditional. Uh, they indicate where they're from on a map. There's a big <clears throat> uh, world map. And people put a pin explaining where they're from and they put their names. <clears throat> Sometimes people have a different view of the world. Uh, traditional dances as well. And, and when, I, when I say traditional dance, you know, we ask, well, like, why, what's the purpose of this dance? What, what does it mean? 
<clears throat> and we, you realize during that week that people start talking. And as you were saying, uh, you know, it's this idea of breaking the ice. I remember when I was in grade 12 in, in the United States, I was 18. Uh, it was a long time ago, I can't remember uh, the exact details, but in France or in Italy or in Europe, when you have to go to a party, you have to be invited. If you're not invited, you can't go. Uh, at least in my generation, you know, things might have changed since, but that was the practice. And, uh, you know, I, I spent a few months where I, I wasn't going out, I wasn't going to anyone, and I understood after, you know, that somebody would say, oh, I'm having a party at my house. And that was a general invitation. And if you wanted to go, you could go. And I wasn't going to get an invitation, but had I known. So, and it's important to get out of your comfort zone as well. I, I didn't want to go, you know, it, it would have been hard to go because I, I would have been all by myself, but, but that's what you have to do as well. So, Coming back to this multicultural week, you can involve people who are retired or, or local residents. You know, your mother might have a special a specialty that she can, and you can ask her, well, can you come in and spend a bit of time talking about what you do? And there will be people talking about other things. And, and uh, well, there's the common activity. Uh, everybody ends up eating, and I think we all like to eat. so. So, and that's, that becomes the common, the, the shared uh, aspect. And education, of course, yeah, that's vitally important. And as you were saying, Nadine, I think uh, our children or my grandchildren and my children too, will have an opportunity to attend classes with uh, a, a diverse community. And they won't be afraid of people because they'll know, oh, well, that's such and such a boyfriend. Um, <clears throat> they'll get to know the people in their class. The big uh, current difficulty of people that the, the age of Lou, when they come to class as new immigrants or as immigrants, and you know, my at, at, when I was, uh, we used to call the, the, them cliques, but they're when foreigners come in, they don't have the same reference points, they don't speak the same way, they don't have the same language. <clears throat> how to integrate those, how do we integrate those people? And so I, I would say we, we have to give the chil children and newcomers this ability to, to go to open, to be open to other peoples and also to look at their own friends, their own circle of friends, uh, and, and to look at their own cultures. When, when you want to move ahead, if you want to make uh, progress, you have to kind of come back and take a look, take a few steps back and, and look at what's happening. And then, and, and that can apply to the education of children. Often it's, you know, it's, it's the parents who have decided to immigrate. The children didn't have any say in the matter at all. So they need to understand that need. So there's lots of things we can do. Uh, pairing, uh, give the opportunity of, for families here to share with someone, uh, pair them with someone from elsewhere. You know, you were talking about cultural differences. Uh, you know, I do it this way. Why are you, why do you do it that way? And, you know, I have an opportunity to work with people that I can go and ask if I say, you know, if I say such and such a thing, would, is it, would it be acceptable? Is my attitude good? We all need that kind of information on both sides. I just want to add to that. From a very young age, I was always taught to that, that, that men were the strongest, stronger than women. And I grew up with that belief just on, until I was about 15 or 16. And then I started developing my own ideas. But 
right now, and then this is my, I'm talking about my personal experience here. Uh, there was, there's still this belief that women can't occupy the same position as, uh, as men. But when I look at my mother, when I look at my sister and other women that I know, I'm, I'm forced to realize that women are, are sometimes even stronger than men in, in a number of areas. You know, and, and and this is partly because we see women are more visible. You know, in this in the sports, in sports, in politics, and I think that one thing that's really important that might promote uh, greater dialogue and to to reduce the fear that we have. To, I think the representativity is is uh, another important and in addition to education and other efforts. Benedict is the only person of color that I know of who works in, who's working in Dieppe. And, you know, if I was in, if I was coming to Dieppe and I was a young boy and I wanted to go to the library and all I saw was white people, And and even subconsciously, I'm I'm I trust things more done that that are done by by white people. So I think representation of these groups is different, or is is important. Women now have become. Uh, Have have taken on a more uh, important, more important roles. So I think that in our community, if we want to have uh, a long-term discussion, we have to kind of look at that question of representation. I, I'd like to add something as well. I, I like that fact that you talked about representation. There's a huge problem in, in all industries, uh, film, businesses, there's a, there's a huge lack of representation, whether it's for women, people of color, people uh, that are part of the LGBTQ community. I, I saw a story that about a young person that who is non-binary and it was only when his parents saw a film about non-binary people that they were able to kind of start talking to their child and the same thing applies to women uh, the same thing for people of color it's, it's very important to have that representation even sometimes if it, it might seem a little bit artificial at the beginning I think that we need to normalize it and standardize it. Uh, now, I want to address a different point here as well. Muriel talked about groups at school or cliques, and when immigrants come, all the, these cliques are already formed. Uh, I experienced that in my second school. In my first year, grade five, uh, they had prepared uh, like a poster for me and it was really nice. They had, uh, they really made an effort to integrate me. And that was, but when I went to get to grade six and grade seven, people were a little bit more closed and they had already created their cliques. And uh, I was, a, I, I, I had trouble getting into those groups. And so in my experience, it's very important that questions are asked, uh, that we ask people questions that we that people show interest so that newcomers feel um included thank you dylan would you like to add something yes speaking of these groups in madagascar and not only in madagascar i don't think but in different schools we're used to classes of 30 
students and uh, you stay with them until the end of the school year. But, but I, I think it, we, we become a closer knit group if there's only 30 people in the same class. It's easier to make friends in the classroom, in the same class. But here, students have to go out of their way to make friends. You have to change your classroom uh, every year. You don't see the same people in your classes, and that makes it difficult. And that's what I li live through. But in terms of integration, I also use my experience because I used to hang out with students who already had the key and be, because I hung out with uh, other students who were of a culture that was very different from the Canadian culture, I, I didn't really learn that much about Canadian culture, but it would be important to learn about the culture where you are living currently then just focus on those that you're familiar with. I completely agree with you, but the, and thank you for pointing it out. Perhaps I wasn't very clear. What I was trying to say was that in order to go towards Canadians, to approach them, sometimes, for example, if you are where you are today, it's because you were able to open up to Canadians. But you could do that by being supported in a circle of other newcomers who were experiencing the same problems as you. They had the same concerns as you. They had the same experience, the same fears. So automatically you say, okay, I'm not alone here. And that allows you to strong, feel stronger. And when you're stronger, then you can not, not dive in head first, but at least you put your toes in first and then it opens up the doors to go a little further. And what, what hit me was the story of one of my daughter's friends. She arrived from Colombia. She spoke neither French nor English, ended up in a Francophone school. I think she was in grade five. And she understood nothing in the school. At one point, she started eating peanuts, but she wasn't allowed to eat peanuts in the school. And somebody somebody told her stop that stop that and all all she knew had to say was yes yes and that that went on for six months so you know you have to let people take their place and then at, at one point you you are stronger and it allows you to open up the doors and people who are here the indigenous the acadians the anglophones they also need to take their space. They need to realize that newcomers are not a threat, that newcomers are, uh, yeah, they're not a threat. Yes, and we have to go through dialogue to get there, but we have to give people time and not try and put pressure on people. But as Murad or Lou were saying, well, if you said this, okay, but your culture, you do it that way. Okay, why is he doing it that way? And somebody else was might have been insulted or hurt because he but he wasn't hurt by you it's not a question it's not a personal it's a question of culture of your experience he's doing it because and you you understood something different but that you have to give the explanations you have to give them they have to be given the explanations by the people themselves or by the school or by people who are familiar with that experience and that will allow everybody to move forward together i love this idea of a roadmap because we're all going in the same direction we're, we're all going to head it to the same place. We want our children to be happy, to be good, whether you're a newcomer or, or a person here, uh, we all have the same hopes and aspirations. So we have to know how to take both sides of this and we take the same road to make sure Dieppe and New Brunswick and our lives are something that will be uh, great for all of us. Lou, would you like to go ahead? Yes, I just thought of the story, something that happened to one of my team members on my volleyball team. But before that, I just wanted to say that it's really important to create this support system for both parties. 
for the, those who are trying to learn or all of the parties. You have to have a support system so that if something does happen, if you don't have a, an understanding of each other, you can you know get back up. And you have to create a sort of um, pillar. And uh, so now for my story, I played volleyball in grade eight with my team from school at Carrefour. And one of my team members was an exchange student. And during one of our games, oh, she, she spoke with an accent when she spoke French and English. And another person on the team, on the other team, started laughing at her. And that was just a complete lack of knowledge, lack of education. And it really, it really hurt her. And she started crying. And I could see that it really hit her hard. And we wouldn't have had that problem if that girl had had the education, the girl on the other team, if she'd had the education on different cultures, different accents, different ways of speaking, there wouldn't have been that problem if we'd had a better education. But it all comes from the parents and from the school, of course. Lou, I'm just wondering, did you or somebody else from your team, did you speak? Did you speak out against that behavior from the other team members? Yes, we went to see the coach from the other team, who was her father, as a matter of fact. So we went to see him and we said, she, she did this, that, and the other thing, this is the outcome. And we feel that it is not professional at all. And he took care of it. Luckily, he didn't just ignore what happened. I mean, he was very comprehensive. He talked to his daughter. And I think he excuse, uh, apologized. I think, I don't remember, it was two years ago. But it was very ignorant of her. And it was you know, the actions of a person who was just not educated at all on, on this issue. So, well, congratulations. Congratulations for having uh, spoken out against this behavior. And I can see the way, from the way you're telling the story, I, I can see that you're you're proud of the fact that you defended your team member. Yeah, so well, I think that's the, the right thing to do. Uh, it's, it's normal, so it's the right thing to do. That's the word of the day, it's the right thing to do. Yes, Benedict, uh, we had some great examples of actions that can be taken to promote cultural diversity. We talked about twinning. I don't wanna come back on that, but it shows that we want to uh, implement certain programs and activities in Dieppe. Because in all of the stories that we've heard, and even in my own experience, we always need a family or an activity that will allow us to be a part of the group. And these people who act proactively, those who ch choose, and we know that these people appreciate us, so we, we accept their comments, we are open to them, and it allows us to become a part of the community. Because like Murad was talking earlier about the Canadians and the Acadians and, and all of these other stories, stories of inclusion and twinning. Twinning could be institutionalized as well, or in a, one way or another, it, it happens naturally, but it's, it's very, rare to see uh, free electrons uh, just uh, arriving at a certain understanding on their way. So there has to be coaching or supervision, twinning, or and there's other examples in the community, a better representativity. And something I'd like to f highlight too is the process of economic integration. Because as new comers, when we settle down here, we need to develop professionally we want to move forward. And of course, it's not always easy for an employer to to hire a person knowing that there's going to be all sorts of administrative hassles. You know, the per, does the person have a work permit, first of all? Does that person have a, a study permit? How many hours can the person work per week? Does that person have their, uh, their landed status? Uh, there's all sorts of things that have to be verified. But personally, the employers that I have dealt with, those who have had the courage and the perseverance to go right to the end with the resources that they identified, 
not not necessarily just I mean we're talking about visible minorities women or immigrants but just because they they identified the potential the skills the aptitude of certain people they chose to go further and that was my experience when when I was finishing my MBA in international management uh, I still had my uh, I was still an international student that was my status and because my first employer believed in me he helped me through the process so that I was able to obtain my uh, postgraduate work permit um, so the employers have to continue to be made aware of the fact that we can't we can't give up at the first obstacle or at the first barrier we have to persevere and those are the ways are we're going to be able to um, increase and become aware of the culture of the people who are, are immigrants and i would just like to add very quickly that definitely we have to develop through our work but even culturally because one important thing as well for example myself m m music ser uh, saved me from depression and when i was in montreal when i could when i played music whether you're black japanese chinese or whatever everybody starts dancing and when i played at the rouge i started with african nights and then i was hired as a full-time dj but my african friends when they came they said oh put some african music on and i i refused because i didn't want my boss to to get upset but one day with a little bit of tequila of course i uh, i did put some african music on and nobody noticed and my great surprise some people came to see me to ask me what i had just played and it became very multicultural what i played really overnight and the cultural aspect was one of the ways and a culture sports it's one way to initiate dialogue because one of the things that we could do in order to promote dialogue is to create cultural events and to find a formula to uh, to allow you to bring people together around a table or at an event to allow people to get the experience of another culture to get to know the others for example poutine rapé i hated that until uh, somebody brought me to what, to what is it the igloo igloo on mclaughlin and i discovered that is really good but one of the things that i learned was that you have to really focus on uh, culture and sports in order to uh, promote dialogue murad thank you very much and i was just trying to catch the uh, get to the attention of our dialogue team are there any questions or comments on facebook they're all just great comments. Okay, excellent. Well, it's already time. It's noon. So we're going to wrap up. Dylan, do you have a few words in the closing before I give my words of thanks? No. Well, thank you. Thank you warmly to all of my panelists, Muriel, Murad, and Lou. It was a true pleasure to hear you speak out this morning. You were full of ideas. You opened up your heart. You talked about your personal experiences. Thank you. It was very much appreciated. And thank you, Dylan. We're a round of uh, a, an applause for Dylan. Congratulations. And when I have co-hosts like this, I, I remember it. So I think you've just been recruited for a number of other dialogues. Now, obviously, I'd like to thank Benedict, Expansion Dieppe, and all the great work you do through immigration and always thinking of, remember that we're here to support you. It's really a pleasure for us to host this 
uh, dialogue today. And thank you, Sean Daigle, uh, for technical services. And we're, we always feel uh, comfortable when Sean is responsible. So thank you to France Bouton for the video and everything you've done on uh, Twitter. And thank you to our interpreters, who I'm sure have done an excellent job. And I'd like to thank the city of Dieppe for allowing us to be here. Uh, and, and thank you, Expansion Dieppe. So I hope you have a wonderful afternoon, a great week, and please continue your dialogue on cultural diversity.